Hi there, my name is Rachel Breckenridge and this video presents the structural evolution and resulting facies of the mid North Sea High region of the Central North Sea. This research was carried out with my collaborators Professor John Underhill and Dr Rachel Jameson at Harriet Watt University as part of a two-year postdoctoral research project funded by the Oil and Gas Authority. Over the next 20 minutes or so, I will give a brief overview of the project and its deliverables, and then we will take a look at the structural evolution of the region and how this controls its prospectivity. This presentation was originally given at PETEX in 2018 as part of the PESGB and Geological Society Collaboration Showcase, where it won the award for Best in Show. This slide pack complements the open access release of all research products through the Oil and Gas Authority Data Centre website, as I will outline throughout this presentation. First, let us define what the mid North Sea High is, as very often, as in this map, its extent is shrouded in uncertainty, being represented by a dashed line. The mid North Sea High is a long-standing west-to-east trending high that separates the North and South Permian basins. It was later transected by the Central Graben Rift system in the Jurassic. The polygon shows the study area, driven by the data availability. You can see that I've really looked at the greater mid North Sea High region, and it encompasses three distinct petroleum systems. Firstly, the Fourth Approaches Basin in the northwest, which is an offshore extension of the Midland Valley of Scotland. Second to the northeast, the oil generating Upper Jurassic sourced Central Graben system. And thirdly, the Southern North Sea Gas Basin in the south, where gas is generated from various levels within the Carboniferous. So we know that this region is influenced by three distinct petroleum systems. So why did the Oil and Gas Authority decide to fund a study on the region? Well, these maps show the exploration activity over time, from the 1960s on the left to the present day on the right. They show that despite early interest in the region with a number of wells being drilled, companies soon turned their attention to the more prolific Central Graben and Southern North Sea Gas Basin. This is despite a number of significant discoveries around the margins of the study area over recent years. Indeed, this region currently provides around 9% of domestic gas and approximately a quarter of domestic oil supply to the UK. This map shows the current licensing situation and shows that there has been a recent rejuvenation in exploration interest in recent years. This has been driven by the recent discovery of fields such as Buzzard, Brea and Cygnus in areas that would have previously been considered as lying beyond the mapped play extents. This suggests that play boundaries may have been conservatively drawn towards the mid North Sea High region and serves to highlight the need to question old dogmas and better understand and define structural features. Secondly, there has been a number of frontier-focused licensing rounds in recent years through which a large number of the blocks that are highlighted here have been licensed. And finally, the Oil and Gas Authority sponsored the acquisition of long-offset 2D seismic data by Western GECO over the mid North Sea High, Rockall and Western Approaches basins. That was associated with funding for academic studies such as this one that aimed to understand the petroleum systems and their remain uh, remaining exploration potential. This is the data set that was released open access by the Oil and Gas Authority. The study makes use of over 10,000 kilometres of regional 2D seismic data tied to legacy seismic and well data. Where necessary, additional data was used, including the CGG Lodestone North 3D survey highlighted in the southeast there, and additional well data from CDA. The study aimed to define the structural features across the region and evaluate their geological evolution through time. To produce a robust, robust sequence stratigraphic framework for the region and to review the petroleum prospectivity. All results have been released open access through the Oil and Gas Authority Data Centre website. So let's take a look at the products that are available. 
I am sure that if you're watching this video, you've already downloaded the new 2015 seismic data via the Oil and Gas Authority website. In case you have not, this slide shows an example of the seismic. The survey came with some basic interpretation. I've added to that with the interpretation of 12 regionally significant surfaces across the entire survey shown here. The interpretation has been done through a back to basic seismic stratigraphy approach by mapping onlap and erosional truncation surfaces and regionally significant high amplitude reflections that signify a change in acoustic impedance and therefore depositional environment. Five lines have been chosen for more detailed interpretation and the production of geoseismic or hero lines. These are designed to be printed out large scale, placed on a map table so that they can promote discussion between subsurface teams exploring in the region. This example, which is a west to east section, shows the dramatic tertiary progradation from the east and the subcropping of strata on the seabed to the west. In addition to the seismic interpretation, a huge amount of time and effort has gone into standardising and analysing the legacy well data. These are now consistent across the region with regard to well tops, units, etc., and are available in ArcGIS layers and in Petrel. All the key data I've pulled together to compile a single page well summary sheet for every well in the region. These single page well summary sheets complement a set of field summary sheets in the region, labelled here with respect to their reservoir level. And these are designed to provide explorers with a quick understanding of what success looks like in the region, but also importantly, what learnings can be taken from failure. This is an example of one of those well summary sheets. Each sheet includes general information, a short geological summary, seismic cross-section, a standardised digital comp log, and a well look back or dry hole analysis in the top right. That dry hole analysis has been completed for each play level, regardless of what was the well's target. These sheets aim to provide prospective license holders with a quick look analysis of the aims and results from each well drilled in the region. For example, this is a particularly interesting well. It was one of the first drilled on the UKCS. The red highlighted plays in the dry hole analysis table in the top right show that this well aimed to test the entire stratigraphy down through the Carboniferous. What in fact actually was encountered was a large missing section with the Carboniferous completely absent. So I hope you can see that these summary sheets are designed to capture that history effectively. All these results, the seismic and well results, feed into ArcGIS maps and a set of published play maps. This is one example from the Permian Rutligand play, showing all the key inputs for the final map on the left, so data quality, mapped seismic surfaces, isochrons, subcrops, supracrops, well facies, etc. And that goes into a final map on the right that shows the controls of the prospectivity and the confidence of that interpretation. Again, these are designed to be printed out large scale for use by subsurface teams to discuss on, draw on, argue over, uh, do whatever they want to do to these. So those were the products that you can expect from the Oil and Gas Data Centre website. Now let's take a look at some of the conclusions from the study. As I mentioned earlier, the seismic mapping has been completed using a back-to-basics seismic stratigraphic approach, i.e. the mapping of onlap or truncation surfaces. Four regionally significant tectonostratigraphic units have been identified, separated by major unconformities. I will now take you through the key features of each of these units from the basement up to the present day. There's a huge amount of geology has, <laughs> has happened in the North Sea, so do keep an eye on the geological timeline on the left so that you can follow where in the stratigraphy we are. We start at the basement. There's no point reinventing the wheel, and as FrogTech have previously completed a study of the basement on behalf of the Oil and Gas Authority, here we integrate their results into this study. 
FrogTech have mapped a, dis a number of distinct basement terrains that represent the collision of the Avalonia, Laurentia and Baltica paleocontinents. The existence of granite intrusions over the area has long been known from gravity studies. Here I show the frog tech's mapped granite intrusions as shown in red on the map. The highlighted well, 37251, is the only well in the region to reach true basement. It encountered quartzite cuttings and indicates that the basement is formed of granite cored metamorphics. The frog tech mapping correlates well with basement mapping in this study. This map shows the isochron thickness map for the unit above the basement, so this is tectonostratigraphic unit A. It reveals a complex series of isolated highs and depot centres at this time. Seismic mapping of the basement is extremely challenging, and I'm now going to show you an example of the acoustic response of top basement over the Dogger High along this seismic line. I hope you can see on the left of the seismic section a high amplitude package just below the base sextine. Well data confirms that this represents the Devonian Kyle limestone sitting on top of a structural high. Moving to the east, however, to well site 37251, the high amplitude package disappears and the well confirms that the Kyle limestone is absent. Therefore, the basement can only really accurately be mapped on seismic where this limestone is present. I've mapped this high amplitude package, as seen on the right. It's found only on the Dogger High and the Ock High in the northeast, and this is confirmed by well penetrations, which are also shown on that map. Therefore, we can conclude that granite intrusions formed these highs as early as the mid Devonian, and I will show you that due to their granite core nature, they have remained buoyant throughout the Paleozoic and Mesozoic. The overlying Devonian and Carboniferous section is extremely challenging to map on account of its heavily faulted nature. There is evidence for multiple extensional and inversion events, and you can see a nice inversion anticline in this seismic section. Data quality reduces significantly in the northwest of the study area, where the Highland Boundary and Southern Uplands faults cross the region. Imaging is a key challenge, however this section is of significant interest as it contains a number of plays within the Carboniferous. Tectonostratigraphic Unit A is topped by the base Permian unconformity, shown here in the seismic in the teal colour. This erosional truncation surface was formed during the Variscan orogeny, and the seismic section clearly shows the highly angular nature of the unconformity. This erosion forms a complex subcrop of Devonian and Carboniferous across the region with important implications for source rock distribution. This seismic line shows nicely the highly reflective coals of the Westphalian source rock. Directly above the base Permian unconformity sits the Permian rock ligand which is sealed then by the Zechstein salts. So we almost have an ideal petroleum play of source, reservoir and seal. But unfortunately, mapping shows that the Rotligand reservoir is absent over much of the mid North Sea High, as this isochron thickness map shows here. In the north, the Aeolian ox sandstones onlap the high, and to the south, the silver pit basin thins onto the high. Let's zoom in for a closer look of this uh, southern margin. I want to bring your attention to the dashed black line at the very south of this map, which indicates the previous northward extent of the Rotligan Play in the southern North Sea. This was previously defined by the southern margin of the Silver Pit Playa Lake. That was, however, prior to the rediscovery of the Cygnus Field in 2002, which opened up a northern shore face to the Silver Pit Lake. The dry hole analysis well rosettes are shown, with the grey crossed rosettes indicating that the well did not penetrate this level. So you can see that there's a huge area to the west of Cygnus that remains untested at this play level. And seismic mapping shows that there could be further Rotligand potential in this area. 
Moving up to the Permian's Eckstein now. The isochron thickness map clearly shows evidence of salt movement in the north and south Permian and fourth approaches basins, and this is confirmed in the seismic section shown bottom right. Elsewhere the seismic shows evidence for carbonate ramp and build-up morphologies, as can be seen in the top seismic section where three events of carbonate growth can be seen. Looking at the well data, the existence of carbonates is confirmed, with isochron thins showing dolomites and anhydrites, and isochron thicks showing halite accumulation. The isochron map can, therefore, feed into a seismic facies map, as shown here. The map shows significant carbonate deposition to the east on the Dogger and Ock platforms, indicating that these were relative highs at the time. This was separated from the Mid-North Sea High Carbonate Platform by a north-south trending seaway that connects the North and South Permian basins. In addition, although not penetrated by wells to date, seismic mapping suggests an additional platform at the north in Devil's Hole. This play produces at the Ock Field in the northeast, and there's one unsanctioned discovery within an isolated platform in the South Permian Basin at Crossgan. However, this play has not yet replicated the success that it's seen to the east in Poland, where numerous fields produce from this stratigraphic level. Moving up now to the Mesozoic. There's evidence that the mid North Sea High remained a regional high throughout the Jurassic and Triassic. This is evidenced by the interaction of the Mid-Cumerian Unconformity in the north, which was formed by the thermal doming of the Central North Sea prior to rifting, and the Base Cretaceous Unconformity, which progressively downcuts stratigraphy from south to north. This leads to complex subcrop maps. The Base Cretaceous subcrop map is shown here in the top right. Let's zoom into the south where the Lower Triassic Bunter Sandstone play is found. During the Lower Triassic, limited deposition over the Mid-North Sea High occurred and facies are silt and mud dominated. In the south, however, the dowsing and north dogger fault zones were active and provided a local source of clastic input to their hanging walls. The result is the deposition of the fluvial alluvial Bunter sandstones within the Soul Pit and Silver Pit basins. This play is proven at the Esmond Cluster, where carboniferous source gas has accumulated within salt cord anticlines. Moving up to tectonostratigraphic unit C, the Cretaceous was a quiet time for the region with thermal subsidence and limited tectonic activity. These maps show the isochrons for the lower on the left and the upper on the right Cretaceous. Note the later erosion of these units at the seabed in the west. Despite this later overprint, it can be said that sedimentation was fairly consistent across the region, with the exception of a depositional thin over the flank of the central Brabant in the northeast. The tertiary saw a complete tectonic reorganisation of the region and the true demise of the mid North Sea High. I'm going to illustrate this on the seismic line here. So the early tertiary saw um, relatively consistent sedimentation over the region with some evidence for progradation from the west. This was interrupted by a regional tilting of the area in the mid-tertiary and an influx of sediment from the east. The event is challenging to date accurately. I've added the well tops to the section and it seems to correspond closely here to the top Hordeland or early Eocene to earliest Oligocene. In reality, this is a highly diachronous event. It is, however, clearly later than 55 million years when the boulder was deposited and correlates to the opening of the Atlantic. So there's a little bit of an unknown as to what drove this event. This regional tilting does have major implications for the petroleum systems in the region. Here I show the present day base Permian unconformity, so effectively top carboniferous source rock, on the right 
and then on the left a backstrip surface prior to the mid tertiary tilting. Prior to tilting, the east of the study area remained high over the dogger and oak highs with attractive structures. Tilting may have initiated a remigration of hydrocarbons out of these structures and to the west into alternative traps or even to the seabed. However, the burial to the east has initiated Jurassic source rock generation to charge newly formed traps. So, to bring all of these observations together. During the Devonian Carboniferous, the mid North Sea High region comprised of isolated granite cord highs which formed as early as the mid Devonian. The morphology is thought to be much like the block and trough geometry as seen onshore at this time. The Permian to Triassic saw a move to more regionally extensive high, including the Dogger Ock High. Upper Jurassic rifting to the northeast led to non deposition over much of the region. Post rift thermal subsidence with minor footwall flank erosion or non deposition of the central Graben High was seen through the Cretaceous to lower tertiary. And finally, the mid-tertiary tectonic reorganisation saw the regional tilting of the area and the true demise of the mid-North Sea High. To conclude, the newly acquired OGA data has allowed for a better definition of the mid-North Sea High and an improved understanding of its evolution through time and space. Regionally significant tectonic events have been identified all of which have important implications for the petroleum systems. In particular, major events in the overburden have been noted to have important implications for source rock maturation, migration and trap timing. All products and results of this study are available through the Oil and Gas Authority Data Centre website and I will post the link below. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this presentation. I hope it's been useful um, and will complement the data and report download from the website. Please do not hesitate to get in contact should you have any questions or comments and best of luck with your exploring across the Mid-North Sea High. Thank you.